when people that aren't immersed in the process like we are think about Guantanamo, they're actually not thinking about the 9-11 vibe or the, those that are facing the military commission. They think about the forever prisoners. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 22nd, 2022. General John Baker served until December as the chief defense counsel at the military commissions. You may have read the other day that the military commissions, prosecutors, and defense lawyers are in conversations now about a possible plea deal to resolve the 9-11 case once and for all. That's the case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin al-Shib, and three other of their Al-Qaeda co-conspirators. It has been hanging around in the military commissions for more than a dozen years. And until the other day, it showed no sign of coming to a close. Trial is still a ways off. Appeals will take years more than that. But the current round of plea negotiations promises a potential way out, removing the death penalty from the table in exchange for guilty pleas and presumably life sentences. General Baker and I talked about his history at the military commissions, about why the process has gotten so bogged down and the promise of the current negotiations. Are they different from earlier rounds or is this another fit and start before policymakers fail to take the leap. It's the Lawfare Podcast, March 22nd, General John Baker on the 9-11 plea negotiations. I want to start with your history of engagement with the military commissions process. You were involved in it for a long time and you saw it through a bunch of different phases Start by kind of telling us your story with respect to to this process. So I became the chief defense counsel at the military commissions in the summer of 2015. Before that time, uh, I really had no involvement uh, with the commissions other than occasionally reading an article in the newspaper. In the summer of 2015, I was appointed to be the chief defense counsel, and I and I was the chief defense counsel until uh, December 31st of 2021. And how does one come to be the chief defense counsel? It's an unusual appointment in the context of uh, military law. What, what my recollection is that at the time you were appointed, they actually, Congress actually upgraded the position and made it a, a flag officer position. Is that correct? That's correct. So I was the first that had been selected by a joint selection board. So in 2014, uh, Congress directed that the chief defense counsel and the chief prosecutor be the same grade. And because Brigadier General Martins was a one star, the next chief defense counsel had to be a one star, either admiral or general. So they, they had a, a promotion board that had generals and flag officers from the four services, and they kind of sent a message out to all the military services that if you were an 06 lawyer that wanted to be considered by this selection board, you you had to put your hand in the air. They repeated that process this summer uh, when they picked Brigadier General Thompson to replace me. And why did you step down? I had reached the end of my service limitation. And so you can be a brigadier general for five years, time and grade. I exceeded that a little bit because the uh, secretary of the Navy had asked me to extend about a year ago. And so I just reached the end of my, I guess, the end of my shelf life. I was supposed to have retired in the end of August so that it would have been, I think, a clean a clean period of time. There was a little bit of a delay in bringing General Thompson uh, on board. I think just kind of a bureaucratic delay associated with uh, a new administration in the process. And so they asked me to stay a couple of additional months, and I did. So the reason I'm going through this is I'm trying to figure out, uh, you were there for uh, more than six years, almost seven years. 
And in that period of time, what changed in the military, in the world of military commissions? How many people were tried? How many people were convicted? How many charges were dismissed? How did the world look different in military commissions trial from the time you became chief defense counsel to the time you stepped down? So in many respects, uh, the military commissions process looked, it almost felt like it moved backwards during my tenure. And the reason why I say that is when I came in in the summer of 2015, uh, there was a lot of discussion amongst the defense teams and I think from the prosecution that it looked like these cases were going to be tried within the next couple of years. You know, when I left at the end of 2021, no trial dates have been set. Uh, and so it, it really, this process just feels like it's continuing to move backwards. Having said that, during my tenure, uh, the Al Darby case was completed and the Khan case were completed. So two very old guilty plea cases where the accused had been, I think that they're originally pled guilty in 2012, were finally sentenced during my tenure. Uh, Mr. Al Darby, I think in 2019, and Mr. Khan was sentenced in 2021. So the reason we asked you on to come on the Lawfare podcast was that there is once again some stories suggesting that the 9-11 case, that is the case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his four co-conspirators, may be in or is in plea negotiations and may be heading uh, towards some kind of a plea deal. So again, this has a time passes and nothing changes quality. Tell us about the last time there was a significant set of plea negotiations uh, surrounding this case. So in and I hate to say this, but the years in some respects all run together. I think it was in 2018. There were active ongoing plea negotiations in the 9-11 case when Harvey Rishikoff was the convening authority. And shortly after uh, Harvey Rishikoff began plea negotiations, he was removed as the convening authority. The defense's perspective is that he was removed because he was engaged in plea negotiations. Um, the government's position, and they had a hearing on this issue, is that uh, Harvey Rishikoff was removed because he violated some bureaucratic rules within the Pentagon. I, I, I will tell you that I'm not in any contact with the defense teams on like what specifically they're talking about, but this time it does feel different. And how does it feel different? What's, uh, what are the aspects of the current set of negotiations that feel of a different quality to you? One is political. This fall, we had a, a hearing at the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, I testified and some other people testified from the conservative witnesses to the liberal witnesses to the nonpartisan witnesses like myself, there is almost consensus that the way to end the commissions, uh, just like there's the way to end most criminal cases, is through plea negotiations. So politically, it certainly feels different. What also seems different, and I just know this because it's been reported, so you know, assuming, assuming Carol Rosenberg is correct, that the prosecution is engaged in these plea negotiations. In the past, the feeling was that the prosecution wasn't interested in settling the 9-11 case. And I don't have anything concrete that says that. That was just the feeling that we had. All right. So I'm, I want to dig into that. Let's talk about that hearing first. I look at this as somebody who uh, was initially open to the idea of military commissions. And I say... There is no way these cases are coming to trial in the next few years. We're a minimum of several years off, and that's with in a kind of best case scenario. It's already been 20 years since the event and uh, since the crime and, and uh, a do more than a dozen years since the bringing of the, of the case and the military commissions. The whole thing has become an embarrassment. 
And by the way, after the Majid Khan case, the government has no basis for confidence that it could get a death penalty verdict even when it does go to trial. So why isn't the case for a settlement, a plea that takes the death penalty off the table, a no-brainer at this point? <laughs> you're In some respects, you're asking the wrong person that question. Uh, I have been advocating settling these cases really since, since I came to the commissions. And I mean, my testimony this kind of culminated in my testimony in front of the Senate Judiciary hearing that the only way out is to settle these cases. And, you know, you, you talk about the trials being several years away. If these are death penalty cases, the most important part of the process, or certainly a very important part of the process, would then be the subsequent appeals. And so we may be a couple of years away from the trial, but you know the the appeals are going to go on would then go on forever. I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't want to settle these cases. So that has been true for a long time, and yet the cases have not settled. Whether Harvey Rishikoff was removed because he was in settlement talks, or whether he was removed for other reasons. It is a fact that he was removed and the settlement negotiations stopped after he was removed. Given what you say, that it's the only way out, and I agree it's the only way out, and it's even if, even if you could imagine getting a conviction at trial, it's still years off and then years for, a, for appeals, uh, as you say. What has been the holdup that prevents resolution, or has that varied at different times? I mean, I can only speak to, I mean, with like specific knowledge uh, during the during the tenure that I was the chief defense counsel. I mean, I do know that the that the defense teams have been interested in settling these cases really from almost from the beginning. But the, the big impediment has been the insistence on these being death penalty cases. And this is, seems to be the first time the you know, media reports are now the prosecution is involved you know, in the settlement negotiations. And just to be clear, the difference between that and a settlement negotiation with the convening authority is what? So you ask a good question because really the, the party that's supposed to settle the case is the convening authority. The convening authority is the person that reaches, that reaches an agreement in the military justice or the commission's system with the defendant. But the last time the convening authority did that, uh, he was removed from office. This is one of those kind of intangible things. It's hard to explain, but the fact that the current acting chief prosecutor has said that he's interested in negotiating, really, it, it changes the tenor. I know that the, following the Rishikoff removal, the teams were very hesitant to want to begin negotiating again with a new convening authority unless they felt like people with power were actually going to engage in good faith negotiations. And that seems to be what's happening now. All right, so let's talk about what a plausible basis for settlement is. You mentioned that the impediment is, you know, is the insistence on these being capital cases. I assume that the moment the prosecution were to say, okay, we could settle this on the basis of these being non capital cases. There is immediate political blowback to that, right? I would think that, I mean, and I, I certainly don't want to get into discussion of, about the specific terms of any sort of plea agreement, but certainly there, there could be political blowback to uh, settlement. But the, you know, the deciders have to make a choice. Do we want to end these cases as justly as we can? We're never going to end them justly, and the justice is gone. I mean, it's for the victims, it's just it's taken too long. But if we want to end these, if we want to end this 
fiasco or failed experiment that's Gitmo, the only way to do it is through the plea negotiation process. So why is the question more complicated or difficult without getting into the details of what a settlement looked like? I guess what I'm trying to get to is why is it more complicated than simply saying, okay, we'll resolve it on a basis other than uh, the death penalty, which inevitably means some something life sentence-like. Why is the question more complicated than that? It's not. I mean, it shouldn't. Actually, it's not true. It shouldn't be. I mean, you know, in American court systems across the country, most cases are settled. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm starting as a federal public defender in the Western District of North Carolina, so I supervise all the defense assistant federal public defenders in Western North Carolina. Ninety-five percent of our cases settle. The commissions should be just like that. I mean, settlements, in particularly capital cases, happen all the time. You're asking the wrong person as to why. Until now, the people there have not been parties engaged on the other side that are willing to engage in good faith negotiations. But but I guess the question is, okay, so now they've said it, or at least they've Carol Rosenberg and Charlie Savage have reported that they've said it. So why isn't the negotiation a five minute process? Again, I, I mean, I have no idea what anybody's talking about, but I think that this is the total cop out except that it's Guantanamo, so everything is more complicated than it needs to be. Frankly, I think that it should be a relatively short discussion. You've got, you know, but you have, I assume, lots of different interests you know, from the government's you know, perspective that need to be listened to. And I think that's one of the challenges that has always existed for the chief prosecutor is answering to a lot of different parties in the government. And, and, and I just, I don't, I've never been in that position, so I don't know who all the folks are that they're having to, to listen to or answer to. Well, let's talk about some of them though, because I think we know, we know some of the major groups that have a claim on the way the case gets handled. So one is the families, right? I mean, if you're the chief prosecutor and there's going to be a settlement in which KSM is not going and Ramsey bin Al Shib are not going to get the death penalty, you have to be able to talk to the families about that, and at least some of them are going to be super upset. Is that fair? I yes, I think that that's fair. There's also been there's some family members that have been actively advocating for settlement, but. You know, this is a, you know, a, lar a large group of people that have, a, you know, that have diverse interests. Uh, but certainly the chief prosecutor is going to have to take the consideration of the family members into, you know, into consideration. So the second group is presumably the people in government, many of whom will be in the Justice Department, some of whom will be in the Defense Department, who have a strong justice-oriented interest in a death penalty resolution, right? That, that they feel as a matter of, you know, of retributive justice that this case should be resolved on a maximalist basis given the magnitude of the crime. Do you think that's a significant group of people at this point? I, I mean, I, I, I would have no way of knowing that. I mean, but my, my response to that group is justice coming out of Guantanamo is not possible at this point. So we got to, we got to get as best as we can get. And why, and why do you think that? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, KSM is still KSM. He's still the guy who planned 9-11. You know, Ramsey bin al-Shib is still Ramsey bin al-Shib. Why is your impression that justice is impossible rather than that it's merely late? Because, I mean, underlying all of this is are the actions of our government. I mean, the torture that it, the torture that took place, you know, I see the lens through the, you know, through the chief defense counsel's uh, viewpoint of the world. But really, it's just been the insistence that we that we hide torture um, and that has delayed I mean, that has just continually delayed these cases. And, you know, there are, there are things, and there are things that are classified that, 
you can read about in the newspaper that you that that are still classified. And so there's just this overwhelming desire to hide information from the government people that I, th I think just makes you can't try these cases at this point and get a just result. So that's why I said that's why, in my view, uh, we need to get the next best thing. Third potential roadblock, the question of where to where these sentences should be served. The New York Times has reported that the defendants are very opposed to serving their sentences in uh, at Florence, uh, the in U.S. based prisons. That may be a surprise to people who really want to close Guantanamo, but according to the New York Times, they want to serve them at Guantanamo, uh, where uh, conditions are better than they expect them to be at the Supermax in Colorado. Uh, on the other hand, if you're the Biden administration and you have a policy objective of closing Guantanamo, well, that operates at somewhat cross purposes. And if you're the, the military that either wants to get out of the detention business or wants to retain a foothold in it. I, I imagine there are people who have strong, both in the Justice Department and in the Defense Department, both Bureau of Prisons and DOD equities in the in that question. Is Do, do you think that's a rounding error kind of question, or is that a real factor here? I mean, the, where these sentences would be served at the end of the day is a, is a policy question that I'm probably not the best person to ask, you know, to give you a, a great answer on that part of the, uh, assuming that's part of the plea negotiations, I'm not certain that it would or wouldn't be. It seems to me that one of the big factors that led to this is the litigation of the Majid Khan case and the government's inability to persuade a jury basically not to think about, not to to dwell on the circumstances of Khan's interrogation and detention by the CIA in the same program that these guys were held in. How big a deal do you think the Majid Khan case is to the prosecution at this point? And I think that the Khan case is a, is a tremendous deal to anybody that's paying attention to Guantanamo. I mean, you brought in, I think it was eight at the end of the day, eight members with no connection to the commissions and looked at what our government did and were disgusted. And you, know, you, you, you discussed it about, an, you know, the government's inability to persuade a, a jury. I'm not sure that the, the government's position or the government's job would be to, would to get them to not pay attention because they should pay attention to it. But the con case, I think is a, was a, was a game changer uh, as far as, providing really a view of people that weren't kind of immersed in the process really showed what impact the government's action in torturing these men has had and will continue to have on these cases. So talk to me about the December hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee. It seemed to me this was a basically across the political spectrum there was pretty wide agreement that this was the time to, you know, that we had exhausted all other options with respect to trying these people. And this was the moment to do it. Is there, were you surprised by the degree of consensus at that? Yes and no. Yes, just because it seems like there's never consensus these days. But no, in you know, I've talked to a lot of people kind of across the political spectrum during my, you know, my tenure at, as the chief defense counsel. So was I surprised when Cully Stimson came in and said that he thinks that plea negotiations is the way to end the case? No, because I don't know anybody that has looked at the commissions and says, we need to continue doing it this way. You know, the, the, the hearing, you know, unfortunately broke down a little bit on it seemed like to break down a little bit down on partisan lines where you had the Democrats who wanted to talk about the commissions uh, and the Republicans that wanted to, to not talk about settling the cases. But other than that, I, the, the witnesses were, you know, almost unanimous, not almost, they were unanimous in 
believing that the way to end, you know, the title of the hearing was uh, Closing Guantanamo, Ending 20 Years of Injustice. Everybody agreed the way to end the injustice uh, would be to settle the cases. So I worry, though, that when you move from the witnesses to the politicians, uh, that is, when it's a question among experts, whether they're experts like Cully Stimson, who's at the Heritage Foundation and, you know, ran detention policy in the Bush administration, or whether it's, you know, sort of centrists who've been sympathetic to detention policy, like people like me and Bobby Chesney, or whether it's people on the left, you'll have a very high degree of consensus. But the moment you have an actual settlement, nobody's going to be interested in what Cully Stimson says about it, or what I say about it, or what Steve Vladek says about it. They're all going to jump to the most politically advantageous position and the temptation to demagogue the matter will be overwhelming exactly as it was in 2008 when, or 2009 when uh, the Obama administration came in with the ambition to close Guantanamo uh, exactly the way uh, it has been at every stage when you know, somebody makes tough decisions to actually do something. Uh, And I'm wondering if you think there's any way to mitigate that other than, you know, to, uh, other than to just bite the bullet and take the political, pardon me, shitstorm that's going to happen when, you know, we put butter on this particular bread. Again, this is perhaps the naivete in me, but you know, people need to put the victims at the forefront of this and, you know, coming up with, with judicial finality, because they're, they're, they're never going to have real finality, be coming up with judicial finality is important. And, you know, I would also encourage people to stop treating these cases differently than, you know, we have all kinds of complicated criminal cases in this, this country, and they just, we just let the system work. But, but you know, the realist in me says that you're right. Once, you know, if, if plea negotiations are reached, somebody is going to try to, you know, grab the microphone and, and make political points out of that. And that's, again, I would encourage them to think about, you know, think about the victims uh, and, and maybe think about the rule of law and just let this process uh, wind itself down. Imagine that there were a plea deal tomorrow. and We had the firestorm and it took a week and a week later, there are five more resolved cases among the Guantanamo population. And that would, I guess, bring us down to 33 unresolved cases. Where would that leave us in the, in the world of the Guantanamo problem both the, tr- the portion of it that can be resolved through criminal trial and the portion of it that can't. I mean, certainly, I think that the 9-11 cases in, you know, maybe to a little bit of a lesser extent, the Bashiri case have been the, the central focus point on the criminal trials. But that's still, we still have, you know, they still would need a resolution for the, for the remaining, you know, the, the remaining detainees. But I, I think that settling the 9-11 case would take a would be a tremendously important step forward in figuring out what we are going to do with Guantanamo and the people that are held there. And what do you think? I mean, there's this group of people at Guantanamo. Uh, I'm thinking of Abu Zubaydah. I'm thinking of Hambali. I mean, they transferred Katani, which I, I thought I would have put him in this category, who are you know, at at this point, extremely difficult to try in any forum, maybe impossible. And also, it's very hard to imagine circumstances in which you could transfer them without you know, massive political consequences. And so I'm I'm like, let's say we remove from the 
problem basket, the 9-11 case, as you describe, that I agree, that's a huge breakthrough in terms of uh, resolving the fate of the of the larger Guantanamo enterprise, but there still are these these really difficult problem cases that you know are just going to are, are going to require some additional breakthrough in order to to deal with. Do you have an impression of how the administration is thinking about them, at, or how it should be thinking about them? Well, I certainly have no idea of how they are actually thinking about them. So that that just leaves, you know, how do I think that they should be thinking about them? In my view, they should be thinking we can't hold people uh, without due process. When people that aren't immersed in the process like we are think about Guantanamo, they're actually not thinking about the 9-11-5 or the, those that are facing the military commission. They think about the forever prisoners. And so, you know, my advice to the Biden administration or any administration to follow is that we have to stop holding people forever. Do I have a solution? Uh, no, I just I know that it is a problem to continue to hold people without due process and without any way of, of having an end game in sight. How big a portion of the problem? I mean, one way to think about the 9-11 case is that it's you know, five detainees out of 38, and there's 38, you need 38 resolutions, and this would be five of them, and that's great, but, well, 33 more to go. Another way to think about it is that this case is really the pig in the python, and that once you've bit the bullet and done this, actually it becomes a lot easier to do the other's because however big the compromise is that you have to make in order to get rid of the cases, it's not KSM, right? He's the one who's a household name. He's the mastermind of 9-11. Uh, and, you know, once the pig passes through the Python, it's there's you can get a lot of stuff done. I'm curious which, which school... I, I'm attracted to the second option, but I, I, I worry that, you know... The day after we have a settlement in this case, you know, it'll it'll be a little bit of meet the new boss, same as the old boss. You know, which of these schools do you subscribe to or or to something else? I subscribe to the school of thought that not many people other than, you know, a few of us involved in national security even know what is going on at Guantanamo. When, you know, Katani left, there was really not even a blip. And so, yes, I think settling the 9-11 cases uh, is an important step forward. Uh, but I think that the um, I think they just need to bite the bullet, take whatever political cost there is and figure a way out. And to the extent that there's a political cost, you know, that bill has just come due. I'm curious about your own emotional reaction to Katani's transfer, because I I kind of had two, and I want to be candid about them. One of them was, hey, that was a hard one, and we finally got it done, and that's a good thing. And the other one was a real sense of deprived justice, that the, the, here's a guy who flew to the United States who's on his way literally to cross customs and meet Muhammad Atta, who's probably, I mean, there have been a lot of people who've been said to be the 20th hijacker. He's probably actually is, um, or at least one of them. And this is, you know, an actual 9-11 conspirator and we had him in our custody and then we let him go. And I, understanding that you know, given the way we treated him at Guantanamo, there was no way to bring him to trial, that it's probably the right answer. I still feel a real sense of loss at the absence of an adjudication, at the absence of a judicial finding, at the absence of a, you know, longer prison sentence at the hands of the United States than he received. And I'm curious how, uh, you know, you guys, I guess you guys had him as a client before your time uh, as, as, as head of the office. But I'm curious just what your own reaction to the transfer of somebody like that is. 
you know, the, the Katana case is, it almost like epitomizes why we can't ever do what we did. I mean, we broke the actions of the United States government made it so that we could never get justice for him or for the, or for the victims. And so, you know, I'm, I, I have a sense of, of, of disappointment in, you know, in government actors. I have a sense of, you know, I'm a strong believer in the rule of law and it doesn't, to me, it doesn't seem like we've met the, that we've met any sense of justice if the solution is we think that you did wrong we torture you, we hold you, and then, you know, 15 years later, we send you away and the victims don't get any justice either. I mean, it, I, I have a huge sense of, you know, kind of disappointment and dismay. I think mine feel, maybe sounds like it feels a little bit different than yours in that I'm not just focused on the fact that he wasn't tried, but I just can't believe that we even got here. I mean, you know, the, the, we, we broke this man. Um, and because we broke this man, any victims uh, of any crimes that he committed were just were unable to get justice. How many more times are you and I going to have this conversation before this, not this particular conversation, but some variant of this conversation about the exchanges in individual cases, about the relative value of punishment and accountability for our own side in the way we behaved before this process is finally wound down? Is this another year of effort, another five years of effort, another decade and a half? What's, what's, the, what's the realistic timeline in your opinion? You know, I, I feel like the window they are really in, in not just for the 9-11 cases, the people that are Again, media reports are correct that are having discussions, but I, you know, I, I feel like the window is open now to figure the way out because it seems like the next crisis just always, you know, always turns attention away from, from the decision makers. But, you know, this population, the prison population is aging. Medical treatment needs to be improved. I mean, the, the, the time to strike is now easy for a guy that's, you know, his, his job for the last six and a half years was to, you know, to supervise the defense teams to say, and I understand that, you know, policymakers have much harder decisions to make. But Ben, there's been too many, there's been too many conversations about this over the last 20 years. We, the powers that be just need to make a decision, accept the political cost and figure a way out. We're going to leave it there. General John Baker, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for your service in both in in the role that you left in December and uh, throughout the rest of your career, including as a federal public defender in North Carolina now. Yeah, well, thank you. for. I really appreciate the invitation. And uh, I, I'm a huge fan of lawfare, so keep doing what you're doing. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is the incomparable Hamza Shitu of Goat Rodeo. Hey folks, I know there are some of you who are still not material supporters of Lawfare. And I just want to say that unlike being a material supporter of a designated foreign terrorist organization, it is not a crime to material support lawfare. In fact, it is a virtue. So go to our Patreon page and become a material supporter. It's patreon.com slash lawfare. The Lawfare podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan, and as always, thanks for listening.